Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Took a couple weeks off from recording this, and uh, that's because I started a little sabbatical, and I'm not doing work things. Like last week, I just read books. I recommend this. It's a good plan if you can do it. Books, they're great. We're back. I'm Chris. It's Dan. We're still ourselves. We're still not professional YouTubers, but you should like and subscribe if you remember to do that thing because it makes you cool. That's how it works, right, Dan? Sure, yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> Today, we're back with the last of the Glint Deep Dives. Uh, so it's probably the last time you'll ever see a YouTube video from me with giant, you did what with TypeScript energy on it. But we're going to talk about the last chunk of architecturally interesting bits namely the language server. So to review, week one, we talked about what's the big picture, how do all the pieces fit together? Then we spent a couple times working through the transform itself and how Glint actually represents things to TypeScript. Last time we talked about how the CLI works, including the idea of a transform manager and transform manager pools so that you would understand so that Glint can handle projects correctly. And we sort of hand waved and said, next time, we're going to talk about the language server, and it's basically the same as the CLI, which is basically true, more or less, except the language server protocol is reasonably nice. And then there's the TS server, which was the inspiration for the language server protocol, but they're not the same, which means that to wire things up in VS Code or Nova or NeoVim or whatever else, well, you have to do some wiring. Uh, now, for the most part, as you'll see, that wiring is in the language server protocol implementation, not the VS Code extension. But I think we'll see both of those today to actually show you kind of where the where the seams are. And then we'll have done the thing, which it only took five, six parts, like a lot, because there's a lot to glint. But we've covered it, and hopefully this will be a helpful resource to everybody else. And uh dan comments questions insults for my presentation you know uh no none of the above any insults i'll say for when we're off the air but otherwise <laughs> i think we're good to go perfect all right well let's get to it so let's yeah let's go ahead and dive into the code extension because i think that's a reasonable yes. sort of motivator for everything else we're going to see here yeah um it is, I mean, there's a lot of directories in here, but at the end of the day, it's a single file. Um, it's not very, honestly, not that interesting. Most of what it's doing is juggling events as like code says, hey, this person added another directory root to their workspace and we have to go say, okay, we need to look at those files and essentially just reacting to those things. We register a couple of custom commands. We pay attention to the file system. We do stuff like that, but it's really, it's all pretty straightforward overall. So I think we yeah. can just kind of go through this one from top to bottom and then pretty quickly dive from there to the meat of the language server itself. Um, so right here at the top, we create an output channel. This is where if you go to the, well, I can just show you. You, this is what makes there be a Glint language server option mm. in the drop down here. Uh, we put ourselves together a map of language clients. So each one of these is going to correspond to an instance of the language server, which itself is going to correspond to a workspace root. We keep track of what extensions we care about. This used to be wholly dynamic driven off of the um, environments that were active. Mm -hmm. But as we move toward multi-workspace support, and as things like first-class component templates have become more baked, we hard-coded this so that the extension itself knows this knowledge. Um, otherwise, things get a little hairy if you open up a new workspace folder, like somewhere deeper in your Git repo mm. or something that like, oops, this wanted to add an extra extension that we can't actually know about ahead of time. So we basically just said, you know what? This is our list. This is understood. Right. We can expand it in the future, but we're no longer going to just drive this dynamically off of your uh, environments. And so then at the end of the day, we basically have two functions that make up what a VS Code extension is. We export mm -hmm. an activate and a deactivate. And activate receives this extension context, which basically gives you a way of saying, hey, I here's a bunch of stuff to tear down when I go to sleep or you know, when, I, when you shut down the workspace that activated me or whatever the case may be. And then code itself, if you look up here, we it provides this import that gives you access to mm -hmm 
the editor as a whole unless you do all kinds of things. And so we can say like on workspace, let's go through each folder and say, hey, for anything that was already open when we were activated, we need to start watching it. And we can also say, hey, anytime that changes, anything that was added, start watching it, anything that was removed, stop watching it. And similarly, anytime the configuration changes, and this is the kind of thing that like, this will probably get updated over time as we add more configuration. But mm -hmm. today, the main thing we care about is if you're changing the Glint library path, where this is the piece of config that says, this is where you actually want to load Glint core from. This is sort of the baseline entry point to all of the rest of the projects in this workspace. Right. If that changes, we basically need to start everything all over again. And that's exactly what we do here. We just say reload everything. Deactivate just iterates through all of our open language clients and says, nope, we're done. Go away. Please stop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so as you scroll down here, we can see there's this restart clients. If I say restart Clint server, this is the mm. thing that gets triggered. Mm -hmm. Did we trigger that? Uh, yes. So here we registered the command and said restart clients is restart language server. Similarly, there's the show debug IR, which we made a lot of good use of earlier on in this video series. Um, so there's our restart clients. That's all of two lines to actually do that one. Show debug IR is a little bit more complicated. Um, because this is sort of a made up command that doesn't exist as part of the standard <laughs> language server protocol. Right. Um, but otherwise it's like not really that shocking. You go look at like, okay, what's the open editor? We figure out what the appropriate language client is for that. We say, Hey, this is the request we're going to make. We play some games in this, uh, messages file in the language server to make these a little bit more type safe than they would otherwise be. But at the end of the day, it's still just strings and JSON getting passed around. And then we send that request. And assuming it comes back and it looks the way we expect, we then open up the editor and replace its entire contents with whatever the transform stuff that we got back from the language server was. And we'll look at the implementation for that later, assuming I remember. And then down here, we have the stuff I talked about where we reload workspaces, we add folders, we drop them. This is all not very exciting, other than this is probably worth calling out. So this is from a library that Microsoft publishes. Uh, it's not unique to VS Code, but it is built for VS Code. But in mm, principle, yep. you could use this to interact with any language server from any kind of JavaScript environment. But at the end of the day, we're saying, OK, here, we're instantiating a new client. We have server options, which I'll scroll up to in a second. We hand it that output channel, which gives it the ability to itself stuff messages into that thing and some formatting information and some other things that are not all that exciting. Um, we say that we care about file system changes and we hand it our file system watcher. We say, we basically stick all of those extensions together at the top and say, this is the list mm -hmm. of things I care about. So these are the only documents that are going to result in requests going to our language server in the first place. The interesting bit from our perspective is the server options. So basically this. Um, we want to always make sure that we are using the version of Glint and the version of TypeScript that is part mm -hmm. of your project. And this is something that the TypeScript extension sort of plays with one foot in each world with. Um, they bundle a copy of TypeScript with it, but also give you the ability to say, no, I really want to use the copy from my workspace instead. And, and they're the kind of pros and cons to this. Arguably, there are pros and cons, I think, to both approaches. Um, it's really yeah. nice that like you just get language server feedback when you open a random JavaScript file, even mm -hmm. if it's not in a project at all. It's just like some scratch directory on disk. On the other hand, if you have your editor like, OK, you opened it fresh, it did an update of all of its extensions, suddenly it's on a newer version of TypeScript than what you're using in your project, even if you were on the latest version yesterday. Mm -hmm. Now you might start getting different editor feedback. You might get squiggles where there were none before or any number of other things. Um, so at least today, Glint requires that you have TypeScript and Glint Core local in your project. We've discussed the idea of actually bundling a copy of Glint Core with the extension so that if we don't find it here, rather than just saying, well, can't do anything, we fall back to that instead. Yeah. That might still be something that we do in the future. That design makes good sense to me. Like when I, I joked a moment ago about TypeScript having the wrong default, what you just described is what I wish the default were, which is, is there a project? I'll use it. If not, I'll fall back to my built-in one rather than defaulting to the built-in one 
regardless of whether you have a local copy installed and configured, which gives you the very weird bugs that people sometimes hit where they say, I, why do I have red squiggles this passed on my CI check? It was fine yesterday. What's going on? And the answer is you got a VS code update, which gave you TypeScript 5.3 and TypeScript 5.3 only came out this week and you haven't upgraded to it yet. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the way we do it doesn't have that problem, though it also means that you can't just have a random, ah, let's call this, call this a GJS file or have a loose GJS file and have it just work. So it would be nice to add that layer of fallback. We also avoided, just for a little historical context, we avoided doing that in the pre 1.0 period because we were iterating relatively quickly and we did not want to be bundling an extension that was then going to leave you in the spot where you needed to update the VS Code extension to get new, like to, you know, have things actually work correctly. We tried to keep those as decoupled as possible since by and large, the VS Code extension changes even in the pre 1.0 period, much less than the rest of the system did. Now it's all pretty stable and we could do that. And hey, if you would like to open a pull request, we will helpfully, happily help you get it designed and landed correctly. But mm -hmm. context aside, let us continue. Yeah. So for each workspace directory as they're added, which in most cases there's only one, but you easily can have as many as you like. Uh, we say, okay, first let's check for the workspace. Do you have an explicit library path configured? This is mostly going to happen if you have like some big mono repo where you've got like a Ruby or Python server in the root and your all of your node modules are not actually in that root directory, but nested right. somewhere. We're not going to be able to find Glint unless you say, hey, here's the place where my UI code actually lives. Otherwise, we just default to the current directory that we're working in, which is going to be the workspace. Uh, we try and find it. We play some games with node require in an ES context and ultimately say, OK, we want to look for the Glimp language server from Glimp core. And we give you a nice message if we can't find it, um, because it's confusing if things just silently don't work. Um, but at the end of the day, that's it. We have now located the Glimp language server. And notice that we're calling resolve here. We're not calling require. We are not loading that directly into memory. What we've done is figured out the path to what in fact is some executable JavaScript and pass that off up here to, as our server options. And so what this language client is going to do under the covers, and you can configure this to work a handful of different ways, but by default, it says, okay, you gave me some executable path somewhere. I'm going to boot that up and assume that it's just speaking the language server protocol over standard out. And so it right. just starts pumping data in and expecting stuff to come back. And that can be a little bit annoying because it means if you're trying to debug something in the language server and you stick a console.log in there without thinking, suddenly everything's broken and it's not verified. <laughs> the only way you'll really notice is if you go digging through your logs and see that the extension host is complaining that like, nope, something weird happened. I'm throwing up my hands and giving up because your extension's broken. Yeah. So, and that's it. That is the entire code extension. Um, like I said, it's one big file. At some point, as we start adding more custom commands, like there's a PR right now to add a sort imports command and things like that. Mm -hmm. We'll probably want to break this up a little bit more, but at least for the moment, it's clocks in right at 200 it's, lines. So it's really, it's actually not really nice here. that it's all just in one file and you can just read it top to bottom. And like maybe we split out a commands mm -hmm. That's module kind of and maybe we split out a, you know, some other individual module. But one thing that I, this is a total aside, but I want to call out, it's kind of been floating around in performance JavaScript discussions lately, but I think is worth noting in general. The Node community has this kind of one class, one tiny function per module mentality. And I actually find that really difficult to work in and to deal with. I'd much prefer to group things by sort of concern, uh, feature. Uh, sometimes I'll group things by way of here is a type, whether it's a class or an interface or something, and a set of functions and maybe supporting types that work with it. But whatever you do, you don't have to put everything in one single function per module and then re-export them all. It's a, you, ju you just don't have to do that. It's okay. Yeah. Aside over, <laughs> but I had to get that <laughs> off my chest. <laughs> It's worth calling out because that's relevant here too. And this is part of like Microsoft's own guidance on publishing mm -hmm. extensions and stuff. We do, unlike the rest of Lint Core, which maybe we should consider this for as well, 
Mm-hmm. We do an additional bundling step on this before we publish it. We throw yeah. all of this code at ES Build and say, hey, make this one single file. And that's what we actually publish. So if you look here, like we have a bundle script in here. Mm-hmm. And when we do the publishing, we say, nope, no dependencies at all. Everything should be in this one file. So all of those imports that you saw that we had up here, well, VS Code is an external because the editor itself provides that. But the rest of this right. stuff, like the language client and stuff, that actually does get baked into what we publish. Um, for exactly that reason, we want to have, mm-hmm. have this thing start up as fast as possible. We want to avoid as many chasing down imports and things like that as possible. Right. Which, circling back, makes the question of how do we manage if we want to bundle Glint Core with this slightly more interesting. Yes. I assume we would do something with like an async import there and get ES build to stick that in its a second bundled together file that we would only yeah. load if necessary. But I don't yeah. know. That would be part of the fun of figuring out right. how we wanted to design that. And that's that's why there's design work to be done. It's not as simple as just, well, just do it. Right, yeah. Cool. Uh, so that's it for the extension. And like I said, that really just points us at, OK, so there's an executable somewhere that is the language server. And mm-hmm. I think that's where we want to dive next. Do, do, do. Let's, uh, let me actually, we'll do this properly. So bin, we have bin slash glint and bin slash glint language server. So if we look in there, it's not very exciting at all. It just goes and <laughs> imports language server slash index. So if we look here. And bin slash glint is what we saw last time, remember? Yes, although I don't think we ever actually opened this file. But yes, no, it does it exactly does what you would expect it to do. <laughs> um, so here we have, once again, a pretty small file. Most of this is just gluing things together and saying go. Um, so create connection is what starts that process of saying, okay, we're going to throw G- JSON at each other back and forth on standard in and standard out. Mm-hmm. Uh, the extension itself has this notion of text documents that abstracts away a lot of that chatter over the connection around like, hey, a document was updated or opened or closed. And so this gives us something that we can talk to to ask about things like editor state without having to go plumbing through VS Code mm-hmm. APIs. Uh, Config Manager mostly deals with formatting stuff. I think we can gloss over that here. And then the real sort of magic is this last bit. So we have a language server pool, which is very similar to the um, Transform Manager pool that we talked about with build mode for this UI, where we can't just have a single instance of this because you could have totally different configuration if you have multiple different workspaces open that are doing different things, or workspace routes, rather. Um, But otherwise, it functions about like that. And you'll see as we dive in how we immediately delegate to a specific language server Mm -hmm. instance when we have a request come in. We bind that pool to the documents and the connection and everything. And we'll look at that later. That's where all of the interesting code actually lives. And then we say, okay, this documents thing, bind it to the connection so we don't have to worry about all of that chatter and eventing and stuff. Just give us a representation of it that we can deal with. And finally, we say on the connection itself, all right, Time to start processing events. And so if we dive in here, what this gives us is we basically work through the connection and we tell it a bunch of stuff. We say, when this happens, we do X. When this happens, we do Y. So like on boot, we go through and just process a bunch of formatting stuff. It's Mm -hmm. not very exciting. And then we hand off this capabilities hash, which if we scroll up, I think is where that lives. Yeah. So this is part of the language server protocol. And this is basically us telling the editor, hey, Here's the stuff we know how to do. If it's not in this list, don't ask me about it because I'm not going to give you an answer. So this is how we know, like, okay, we can answer the question, what are all of the references to this highlighted identifier? We can give you something. We don't promise what it's going to look like, but if the user (laughs) hovers over something, we we can probably give you a useful thing to put in that little pop-up window and so on and so forth. And some of these things are just Booleans and some of them have further configuration that you pass in. Um, all of this is documented. The language server protocol has a whole website that's just the specifications mm-hmm. about how all of this stuff works. It's um, it's interesting. It's kind of, well, this is my nerd showing, but like I think it's fun to read through. There's a lot of, of interesting stuff there, and you can kind of see how it's evolved over time, how they've taken yeah. different constraints that have come in and different things people have wanted to be able to do. And so, to, okay, how can we do that in a way that makes sense in sort of a language agnostic way? And you'll also see stuff that sort of like incubates as part of TypeScript itself and eventually graduates to being a blessed part of the language server protocol, Mm -hmm. almost always in a slightly different format. Yay. Also worth (laughs) note is line 25 there specifically. 
uh, mm. which Dan has a good comment on. But this is a place where we we have to tell the server, and this is a good example of the kinds of things that are unique to, well, they're not unique wholly to Glint, but there are things that the protocol allows you to say that says, look, period, yeah, sure, everybody's going to, Everybody in a C-shaped language, Java-shaped language like JavaScript, is probably going to provide autocomplete trigger with a dot because you're indexing into something. But in our case, we also want to autocomplete when you're typing the name of an argument in a template. So you're saying, you know, angle bracket foo at bar equals something. Well, at should allow the autocompletion to say, hey, you're invoking foo. What are the things you can invoke when, or what are the arguments you can use when you actually invoke a foo, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of little details that have to get wired up. So let's see, we come back here. And so now we just start looking at stuff. So here you'll notice instead of talking directly to the connection, this is where we're looking mm -hmm. at that documents object. And we're going to say, OK, anytime a document is open, we're going to find the appropriate language server for it, like I promised. We basically almost always, when a request comes in, there's a document URI associated with it. Um, occasionally, there are like workspace-wide things like restarting the language server that um, are separate. But generally speaking, we're going to have that context. And when we do, we can go and say, OK, we want specifically the server for this URI. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever that happens, we want to tell the server, hey, that file is open. You remember our document cache that we dealt with last time or the time before? This is where we say, hey, no matter what you think you've seen on disk, now we have fresher information. There's stuff that's been typed in here that's maybe never been saved. And we need to act as though that is the contents of the document. Mm -hmm. And similarly, you'll see on did change content, we do essentially the same thing. And then each time each of these happens, other than closing the file, but any time there's an add or an update, we tell the server pool, hey, pretty soon we probably want to issue some new diagnostics because now we have a new file we care about. And that's a key piece that's different about the language server versus the CLI. With the CLI, we're essentially always doing whole project file che type mm -hmm. checking. And so anytime something's wrong, we're just going to print that out and move on. Here, we only care about the things that are open. We're not going to schedule diagnostics for a file that's not there because we don't care. And that would just slow things down. Um, but what that means is that anytime an open file is added or changed, we need to say, hey, let's reconsider what diagnostics we need to show. And it's probably worth note here that that's matching TypeScript's behavior on open documents and diagnostics. You could make a case, and other language servers for other languages do actually handle this very differently. Rust Analyzer, for example, does not do what Dan just said for the Rust language. And I, I would have to check, but I think the OCaml language server acts more like the Rust language server here. Uh, you can imagine wanting a mode where you say, no, 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 give me all the diagnostics because I want to go actually be able to follow through and see everything that changed when something, everything that's now not type checking when things are, you know, out of out of sync across my workspace. TypeScript by default does not do that. It only shows you the things for your extensions, which are actually, or your files, which are actually open. And I think Dan is looking for the setting. Did they add a setting for this? Yes, I found it. This has been around. It's been experimental for as it's been around, I think, oh. a couple of years now. But there is an option to say, actually, I want whole project error reporting. It is slow. The one yeah. time I turned it on. Yeah, because it. anybody who's run TypeScript knows that type checking a non-trivial project is kind of slow. Uh, in TypeScript's defense, they're doing a lot and they're mm -hmm. doing it in node and they're continually working to make it faster. But uh, Rust and OCaml's language servers have the advantage of being able to be written in Rust and OCaml, which are a lot faster than node, especially for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's good to know. You will find if it's a large, large project, like even the size of the Glint project, which is not a very large project, it's on the order of tens of thousands of lines. So we're not talking hundreds of thousands or millions mm -hmm. of lines of code. You'll find that it's slow. There was, for a long time, a third-party extension which did this, and it may still exist. Uh, it's good to know that this exists now, and I'll probably turn it on for small projects. Mm -hmm. But that is what we're mirroring, is the TypeScript behavior here, the default behavior. 
we could, in principle, and if someone's inclined to, again, pull request welcome, you could add an experimental enable project diagnostics to Glint, and we would probably just want to keep that in sync with whatever TypeScript itself is shipping as. If this thing's experimental, the Glint version's also going to be experimental, etc. Another thing that's worth calling out that I don't think I had really internalized until working on Glint is that a big part of what's expensive about whole project type checking isn't just the type checking. Because to a certain degree, you have to do a lot of that work anyway. You can leave out the yeah, leaves, but the deeper you get, the more you're going to be checking these files anyway. But yep. it's actually formatting the errors. And one thing, one part of how I learned that was in early performance comparisons between TSC and the Glint CLI, I was finding that Glint was like, a hundred times slower. And I was like, this sucks. We can never ship this. This isn't going to be useful at all if it's this much slower. <laughs> and in fact, what I realized eventually was 95% of that time wasn't spent type checking all of the additional like glintified versions of templates and stuff. It was spent printing out all of the errors from all of your templates that had never been type checked before. <laughs> and so as soon as I commented out the like print diagnostics line, then it was, oh, this is 50% slower or whatever. Yeah. And it yeah. seems way more reasonable. Um, and so that, you know, in general, anytime you were upping a strictness level on TypeScript or adding type checking for whole blocks of your app that didn't have it before, you're likely to get more errors. And the formatting of those errors is not necessarily fast, particularly if you're doing all kinds of like formatting and snippeting with highlighting and nice colors and stuff. So that's um, interesting. How much of that is the actual formatting and how much of it is the IO of then sending that? across the pipe, uh, well, turning it into JSON after formatting it and then sending right. it across the pipe and then deserializing it and all of that. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't give you an exact breakdown. This was a couple of years ago now that I noticed it, sure. but it was definitely a non-trivial portion of it was the actual formatting and not just the like printing it out. I know. Hmm. So, um, and this was all with the CLI. I assume it would be comparable with the language server, but you're formatting, like you said, to JSON instead of to like right. colorized terminal text. So. Right. That makes sense. Today I learned. <laughs> uh, so anyway, files open, files close, files changed. This, I mean, I mean, everything in this file is going to be stuff that's different about the language server than about the CLI. But like <laughs> at the core, the the thing yeah. that is really, really different, aside from the kinds of yeah. questions we want to answer is that we have to deal with this extra layer of there is the file system. And then also there's this other thing that no one can see, but you have to know that it's true that sometimes files look different. Mm -hmm. And that we talked about like uh, the speculative flag in the document cache. And like that specifically is to handle this scenario where the language server is being told about a file that we've never actually seen on disk. And we kind of just have to assume that it exists mm -hmm. in the magical world of the editor. So. Um, so yeah, as we scroll down, I'm not going to go into super huge amounts of depth on each of these things. Yeah. It starts to become on code action, on prepare rename, on apply the rename, on right. request for a completion, on request to resolve the completion. <laughs> so like these two actually, on completion is what gives you the list of things when you like mm -hmm. command uh, dot or whatever. Completion resolve is the secondary pop out you get when you've highlighted one of those items and you might get further information about it. So like, uh, of course I'm not getting any of that pop out here. What goes over here? Well, anyway. <laughs> uh, it does cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On definition, on references, on work, like, it just mm -hmm. goes on and on. And you can kind of get a sense of on, like, there's a lot of stuff in here. We've Yeah, on code lens, on document links, on initialize, mm -hmm. et cetera. And this is where, when we've talked before about there being a lot of just, hey, there are a bunch of things that are potentially wire upable. Th this is the list, basically, is, hey, if we want to add code lenses, well, we need to do connection dot on code lens, et cetera. If we want to do uh, an outline provider, I think this is where that goes, et cetera. Um, so, and, and we do want those. They're in many cases relatively straightforward, um, but they just need to actually be done. So, 
Uh, fun fact, if you're trying to provide a document outline, the method you actually want is on document symbol, obviously. Not anyway, obvious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then there is also this sort of generic on request. And this is what lets us do things like implement custom things, like getting the intermediate representation for a template. Mm. Um, this is also where stuff, so like I learned from this PR for doing sort imports, um, that this is actually a custom request. I had always assumed, because I, it's not a command I ever use, that this was something that was implemented as a code action and you would get the little light bulb and you would click it and it would sort your imports. But in fact, it's registered with VS Code as a custom command that you can do from hmm. the command palette or by right clicking or whatever. Um, and it comes through as a custom language server command, so. Huh. Uh, and then finally, this is, we said in the somewhere, oh, we said this was on the VS Code <laughs> side that we were talking about this. We had specifically set up to tell the editor, hey, we want to piggyback on your file system watching. Tell me whenever something changes on disk. And this is where we actually handle that. So these changes come in. And we basically, in the language server, just have a method we call for each of these things. It says, hey, regardless of what's in the editor, be aware that something on disk also changed. And resolving these kinds of things can be particularly fun if you have like unsaved changes in your editor and also you like changed Git branches on disk or something. Mm. Um, so we, all, we have to have sort of a careful line of succession in terms of what the most important source of truth is. But at the end of the day, this is the file system half of that. And similarly, anytime we get on disk changes, it's time to go say, oops, we should yeah. check in to see if there's more diagnostics. If you deleted a module. Yeah, that might have implications for type checking for other modules you have open right now. And were they importing from that module? Ah, there's a bunch of things that are going to need to have some diagnostics shown. It's a, and vice versa. Uh, if you add a file, all of a sudden a bunch of diagnostics might change what they are or go away. We have a whole suite of tests as part of the language server suite and the CLI suite and the build mode CLI suite and so on and so <laughs> forth for all of those scenarios because it's very easy to mess them up. Yeah. Um, and so we specifically are like, okay, when you add a file, when you remove a file, when you change one, and so on and so forth. Um, so let's dive into the language server pool itself. Ooh. Um, so here we have some stuff for loading config, and we basically keep a mapping of loaded config to server information, where that server information is the actual instance of the language server. It's the root directory that where that was loaded from, and it's also this schedule diagnostics thumb mm -hmm. we can call specifically for that server. And so we hand it the connection, the open documents, this is what I clicked. I don't know why we use that. Oh, it's when watch files change, because there we have to actually go through all of them. We don't get the information we need about what the workspace root was. Anyway, but the key bit is this with server for URI. And this is where we say, hey, we found out something about some document somewhere. Give me the server details for it, please. And so we look it up. We look, find some config. If we have a server yep. for it, we give it back. Otherwise, we launch it. Remember that we launched it. Give that back. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where, if you ever get unable to start Glint language service in your editor, this is where you can kind of follow that back to. Generally, this isn't something you should see very often anymore. This generally indicates that like you've got something bad going on in node modules. But it used to be a very common message that would pop up. Mm -hmm. um, this should look very familiar. This is essentially mm -hmm. what we saw with the CLI before. We're making a document cache and a transform manager, and then we instantiate the language server itself, which we will get to next. And then finally, we have this diagnostic scheduler. And this does a couple of different things. One is we debounce. We say, OK, you don't really need new, document, new diagnostics any more often than once every quarter second. Um, 640 kilobytes of RAM is all anyone should need or whatever that was. <laughs> um, and, and that quarter of a second thing, like it's relatively arbitrary, uh, but we're, as Dan said earlier, we're doing a lot of work, including all of that formatting work, which can be, it can, it can take a lot. We don't want to do it every millisecond or however fast you manage to be typing that causes language or causes notifications to be sent that the file has changed, et cetera. We, we want to do that on a, on a reasonable rate. A quarter second is reasonable because that that's actually a lot. Uh, you're going to get 
more or less real time feeling feedback from that kind of thing without being paying the cost of doing it instantaneously, constantly. Mm -hmm. This also helps guard, like when you're just typing in one file, it's mm -hmm. likely going to be pretty quick to just check with the language server, hey, any new squiggles? Um, but for cases where like you are switching Git branches or something, that can be a right. lot of file system churning. There's no guarantee that we're going to get all of those events from the editor in a single big chunk. They could be trickling in over the course of half a second or more. Yeah. And so this gives us the ability to make sure that we're not doing a ton of work that might actually, like, again, this is Node. Everything is single threaded. We don't want to get so bogged down that we actually get a backlog of requests coming in that we can't deal with. Right. Um, and then we... Basically, we have this nice fallback, which hopefully should not be popping up nearly as often as it used to be. Um, but essentially, if something goes wrong as we're trying to get diagnostics for a file, which it can, TypeScript is very finicky if you ask it about a URL that it doesn't know or things like that. This is where we say, OK, something went horribly wrong. We don't want to just silently do nothing in that case. And so what we do is we stick a diagnostic at the top of the file that says, hey, something horrible happened. We don't know what it is. but." Uh, just know that you're not getting any useful feedback for this file. And something that's worth, I think, calling out here that you'll notice is down here is that in all of this, we've been talking a lot about thinking about how we schedule diagnostics. Mm -hmm. Diagnostics are the one piece of the language server that are sort of push-based. The editor is never going to ask us, OK, now I'm ready for right. new diagnostics. It is our responsibility to react to changes on the file system and in the editor and at any given time, be ready to say, OK, and now here is where there are problems. Mm -hmm. And that's going to power both the red squiggles in your file as well as I find people either know about this and use it constantly or don't know about it and are shocked that it exists. Um, problems view. Mm -hmm. There is this problems view. And this, this is powered off of the exact same pieces of information that give you the red squiggles in your editor. Um, but this is where you can actually see that behavior we were talking about, where like if you have a red squiggle and then you close the file, not only does that file stop being read like in the nav bar and you, there's no more red squiggle there, it will also disappear from the problems listing here. Right. The ESLint language server does the same thing, but like as Chris called out, the Rust one doesn't. The Rust always gives you whole project diagnostics. Mm -hmm. so. And it might be worth, since as you noted, Dan, a lot of people don't actually have experience with that. It's either one of those, like you use it and it's just part of your workflow or not. If we just introduce like on line 130 uh, nonsense, semicolon or something. Yeah, there we go. Error. Okay. Now you can see the actual, you don't have to have a hover up over it. You don't have to be anywhere near it in the file, but it's going to give you the same information that that hover would. And then you can use that to quickly step through all the errors in a module or in all the modules that you have open in your editor right now. It's very mm -hmm. nice. It is. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you look at this, you can easily see that it's the exact same information. It's just formatted slightly differently. Mm -hmm. And for every one of these that you introduce, there will be an additional one down here. Now I've broken things more terribly. But... <laughs> And that's really it for the pool. Um, like I said earlier, this is really just a pretty lightweight layer on mm -hmm. top of the actual language server, which is where all the fun happens. This is just about dispatching when you have multiple of these things running and making sure we know what files correspond to what servers. So let's look at the language server. How big is this one? It's a little chunky. <laughs> Um, Still nothing like some of the ones we looked at a couple episodes no, ago. No, not at all. It could be much worse. So here we have a zillion imports. Most of them are from third-party libraries, but we also have a little bit of like yeah, utilities for translating between how TypeScript talks about things versus how the language server protocol talks about things, as well as just references to like types for things like transform manager and our own config and stuff. So the language server yeah, I mean, I guess the right thing to do is just kind of to go top to bottom. And as we get into the stuff that's repetitive, we can go a little faster. But essentially, it looks a lot like the stuff we talked about with the CLI, mm -hmm. where we're saying, OK, we have some config, we have a document cache, we have a transform manager. And we, because we're dealing with an editor, have to keep track of things like, OK, what files are open, as well as from our config, like what are all of the files that are in this project? 
And that's always kind of a fun song and dance because TypeScript itself is very picky about what files it does and doesn't know about. And like I mentioned earlier, it will happily just throw an exception if you ask it a question about a file it doesn't think it should be asked questions about. And so we actually have to play some games here where we keep track of this ourselves. And yeah, here, anytime you ask the TypeScript service about something, it's going to call this get script file names to make sure that it actually, that that's a script that it knows about and should be asking questions about. And so this is, we pull our open and root files together and say, no, 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 this is fine. This is something you know about. <laughs> and then a lot of these are going to be just calling straight through to the document cache of the transform manager. So we yeah. talked a lot about how we keep track of versions of each file and how we have to deal with companion documents when you have standalone templates and stuff. This is why we do all of that is to be able to implement this get script version hook. Uh, get script snapshot is essentially read transform file, except it wants it to be a script snapshot instead. I don't know why that doesn't just call through to read file. I'm sure there's ver some very specific customization. <laughs> um, Inevitably. But it doesn't just call through to read file, so we have to also implement that. I Maybe it's for caching. Maybe it's so, th I mean, that's exactly what we're doing here, I guess, is we're going through, yeah. but we also do that caching for read file, so. Um, but yeah, so like file exists, read file, read directory, all of this is stuff right. that we saw. We saw these last time. That's exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then there's some stuff where we just say, actually, this is ts.sys has the same thing, but it's under a slightly different name, or we just need to pass it through ourselves. And finally, just like with the CLI, we've created this service mm -hmm. host, and now we actually create the service. And we just immediately call get program, which is what actually triggers the type checking behavior. Program is the object that you can call things like get diagnostics on. And so as soon as this is instantiated, we want to go ahead and start that so that we're ready as requests come in from the editor. And then all of the rest of this is basically just methods that are called in that binding file that we looked at. Mm -hmm. This is stuff like file is open, file is updated, mm -hmm. file is closed. Same thing for watch files on disk. And all of it, you know, you can look, there's details here. Some of them are more or less interesting than others, but they all boil down to a lot of the same stuff we saw with the CLI. Right. Where we're having to like play games with companion pads and stuff. But at the end of the day, it's mostly just, well, a watch file went away. We need to like, that's stale now. We need to clear anything we think we knew about module resolution mm -hmm. because it's invalid, et cetera. Um, here's get diagnostics. Again, this, this is should look, look very, very familiar. Recent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, really, the Ooh, only you got a flat map in there. How exciting! Oh yeah, uh, I don't remember why, but yes, yes, twenty twenty two or twenty one <laughs> or whenever it was. Yeah. Um, but the big difference that you'll see is that unlike with the CLI, where okay, we are constructing our own diagnostics or making them look a little different, there we're ultimately handing them back to TypeScript, and so we want to mm -hmm. give them in the same format that TypeScript talks to them about. Here, because this stuff is going out through the language server, we need to convert right. to how the language server talks about this stuff. And so like, if we look at severity for diagnostic, this is not a very exciting function at all. It's just, <laughs> OK, if this thing was Here's the TS diagnostic category error, now it's the language server diagnostic <laughs> severity error. Message becomes information. Suggestion becomes hint. Warning stays warning. Um, yeah, as we noted at the top, the language server protocol was inspired by and continues, as Dan mentioned a couple minutes ago, to be driven in many cases by experiments coming out of TS server, but they're not the same. There is actually an open issue on TypeScript to switch over to fully using LSP instead of their own server. And if that ever actually ships, this will simplify a lot of these things. But because there's a lot of things out there doing this, that's actually a harder thing for them than just implementing it. They can't just say, ah, we now have LSP. They actually probably, to make that work, need to make TS server be a facade over at LSP. And so you would have then exposed, okay, here's for all the clients who are still speaking TS server, you're fine. For anybody who builds a new thing talking LSP, you can just str talk straight to the LSP and then eventually deprecate TS server and move on. But those are the kinds of considerations when you have this kind of weird bit of historical baggage that you actually have to solve for. So it's not as straightforward as it might sound to be like, oh, just switch everything to, you know, 
just use an LSP version with TS6. We go, okay, well, you're going to break a lot of, you're going to break us, you're going to break Viter, you're going to break, or Volar, or whatever the successor there is named, you're going to break Svelte language tools, you're going to break everything. So mm -hmm. there's community work to be done as well. Yeah. It's also worth calling out, there is a TypeScript language server project, which people frequently confuse for TS server, that yep. does what we're doing here but like for every single thing and does it in a, like without doing any of the transformation stuff we're doing, it's just about translating right. between the two versions of how do things talk about what's going on in the language. And that's Ooh, what that... things like NeoVim and Sublime use, if I recall mm -hmm. correctly. And they're generally pretty good about staying on top of things as stuff change in TypeScript itself. Yep. I remember looking at that early in the development of this to figure out if there was a reasonable way for us to piggyback on it and avoid doing the translations ourselves. And my recollection is that it wasn't easy to patch the host in the way that we needed to. Mm. Um, and they were also in a period of sort of like stagnancy at that time, which made it unclear if the project was going to continue on. Now it seems to be very vibrant. And I think as things like NeoVim and stuff have moved over to using it, it's gotten very yeah. popular and it, it seems to be in a good place. Um, so that may be something that's worth looking into at some point to see if we can get rid of some of this munging and try see if there's a way for us to patch into that and do our host patching there. Um, I have no idea. That might get us some things for free. It might make some things harder. I, <laughs> it's as much a sort of like design question as it is a like feasibility one. So right. as often. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, another example. So like tags for diagnostic in the TypeScript version of the world, there are just these like Boolean flags on diagnostics that say, hey, this is indicating that something is deprecated or unnecessary, whereas the language server protocol wants that to be an array of these tags. And so you'll see a lot of that kind of stuff or like, well, we have script element kinds versus symbol kinds, and they kind of sometimes map to each other and sometimes don't. It's fun. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so if we look at... I'm going to find symbols is kind of boring. Well, fine. We'll start with that because it's boring. <laughs> uh, boring is good. Yeah. Although I've already, yeah. But essentially, like a request comes in. This is actually one of the instances where, oh, I used find symbols to find symbols there. I did not do that on purpose. But that's when you do this, when you hit command T uh -huh. and say, or start with a hash. This is doing like a workspace wide search for symbols of a given name. And so this is one of the instances where we don't have a URI coming in. And I think we just farm this out to every language server, which is probably the reasonable thing to do. Anyway, you just get a string that's the query you're looking for, like what I've got up here. Um, and TypeScript calls that get navigate to items because sure, why not? But this is the pattern that you'll see is we, okay, okay query comes in, we say, hey, TypeScript, do this for us. We mm -hmm. don't want to know care what that actually means. Just go do it, please. And we get back a bunch of these navigate to items, which are pretty gnarly union type for reasons I don't care to look into. <laughs> um, but what we get back is all of this TypeScript formatted stuff. So we convert a TypeScript text span to a language server location. Mm -hmm. And we convert the script element kind to the symbol kind. We looked at that and give it back. Um, we could turn this into a flat map if we wanted and then get rid of that filter, but that's beside the point. Now, if we go look down here, text span to location is actually taking some additional steps. It's, this is not just like a structural transform. Mm -hmm. This is actually going through mm -hmm. and transform. figuring out, hey, what's going on? Yeah, this is accounting for the fact that TypeScript only sees the transform version of these files, but what's in the editor is the original. And so right. this is where we say, hey, what was the original range represented by this text span? And if something changed, then there's nothing. Um, specifically here, this is emit.nothing, I think, when we talked about the transformation process. There are times when we need to right. note something in the tree, but like basically just stick nothing in the corresponding mm -hmm. output. And that can produce nodes that where we need to not have them. So this is essentially just a short circuit for that. Otherwise, we get the contents of the file, convert things to these positions, and then do our transformation to make it look the way 
the language yep. server expects it to. So we deal in URIs instead of file paths, and we have these positions instead of just offsets and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, get completions is a little bit thornier, but maybe that's worth talking about because we did a simple one. This is the same pattern, just spelled out a little differently. We essentially say, hey, what was, so here we are talking about a specific file at a specific location and potentially with some formatting configuration. Right. And we're going to say, okay, first off, let's figure out in terms of what TypeScript sees, what location are we actually talking about? So we get that back. Uh, what is, is analyzable file? Ah. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is where we decide if we're dealing with JavaScript or not, essentially. Um, or like random other files. Um, in particular, this can be, so if you have like a .gts file open, but you don't have the template imports environment active, then this is, this is actually what we started off talking about with the extensions. Mm -hmm. um, so we tell code, hey, we know what a GTS file is. We can deal with that. And so we might get requests for those. But if you don't actually have the extension active, then we're not going to know what to do with that file when the request comes in. And so this is where like, the synthesized script path, if you have a GTS file and no environment that handles that, you're not going to actually get a .ts file on the other side. That will only get produced if we know what we're doing there. So mm -hmm. this basically gives us a way of short circuiting instead of throwing a big error when something goes wrong. Similarly, this we only deal with JS files at all when you have said allow JS. Right. This is slightly different than the built-in TypeScript behavior, where it will activate on JS files even if you mm -hmm. don't have a config file there. Um, I don't know if we need to revisit that or if this is the correct thing to do. It might be the right thing to do. Uh, according to past me, you can't see where my cursor is moving, but in the highlighted line here, it says handle.js files in TS projects correctly. Clearly 12 <laughs> months ago, I thought this was the right thing to do. So if, you, if we're curious, we can go look at that PR and see why we did it this way. But regardless, again, you'll see a lot of these sorts of short circuits where it's like, well, mm -hmm. we got a request, but it's not actually something we know what we can do with. So we're just going to safely avoid doing any extra Skip work. this, yeah. Yeah. So we've looked up where we're operating and potentially a mapping tree, if you'll remember those. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind I talked when we talked about mapping trees about we're not just looking at location mappings. We're also keeping track of what was the actual node in the template that produced this mapping. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of situation where we care about that. Yeah. So here, yeah. if we're in the space of a template where just like arbitrary text goes, this isn't like between curlies or in parentheses in a sub expression or something. So specifically, if this is text content or the top level template embedding, then we don't want to give you completions. You're just typing human readable prose here. And it would be terrible if every keystroke gave you the whole list of like JavaScript globals that happen to start with that letter. Um, this is not how this originally shipped. It used to be if you were just typing free text in a free text area of a template, you would get every JavaScript global that started with that letter. That was fine. You could just ignore it, but it was a lot of work that we were it's doing early, and it was a yeah. little bit of it was distracting too. Yeah. So, um, or if uh, actually, what is this condition? This is why I should do my homework before we do these. <laughs> if there is no mapping, but it is a no mapping. template. Or if there's no mapping and yet we are in a template file. Right. Which I guess would be in the case maybe where we have something like uh, check standalone templates false. So even there, I think if we have check standalone templates false, we produce a JS file. So in principle, you could still get completions for that. Huh. This may be a similar condition to this, actually. Mm -hmm. If you are in a template imp imports only project, I think we always think we know what to do with an HBS file. Like at a minimum, yeah, I don't know. That's my best guess. I would have to go look at. What is the, um, now I want to know what the commit message is. Don't send zillions of spurious completions in malformed templates. Uh, oh, malformed yeah, yeah. Ah, yes. Okay. The commit message is the key here. So we can be in a template, but if you, 
I remember fixing this bug mm, now. Mm -hmm. This is not, it's not the same as this. This is, if you are in a template, but you've got like a loose curly or something that's mismatched, right. then there won't be a mapping because we couldn't transform it. It was syntactically right. invalid. Right. But we still know that you're in a template. And if mm -hmm. the editor decides that it's time to get completions, we don't actually want to. It's going to ask that. us for them, but we can't. Right. Yeah. And um, this is a case where also, we've talked before a little bit about it would be nice to have a parser that does error recovery because then in principle, we actually could give you completions. This is why we really can't if you have a malformed template. And a good example of this is maybe, Dan, you can even show this a couple lines up or down where you can have a malformed like in JavaScript, you can start typing if open parens and get completions, even though this is not valid syntactically. Uh, we're, we're in a so spot where like, this is, this doesn't actually pass the parser, but the parser is error recovering. And so it can just say, okay, this, the, the error ends right here and the rest of the file is still valid after it and before it. And therefore I can give you completions and information and all the things you might want. There is no such parser for Glimmer. I started monkeying around with building one in Rust with uh, parser combinators a year ago and then didn't have, like it wasn't wasn't something we actually had the time to go build at work full time. And I have wife and kids and another hobby, so I wasn't going to do it in all my spare time either. But that's the kind of thing that going forward, the community would really benefit from. And here's a good example of why. The reason the Glimmer parser doesn't have that is because it wasn't built with this use case in mind. You don't you can get some benefits from an error recovering parser, even in just a sort of one shot uh, compilation like we normally have done with templates because you can report multiple errors potentially. But the, you know, the benefits of that are much lower because you, you have an invalid template, go fix your template is basically all you really need to say in the case where you're doing a one shot compilation. Whereas when you're doing something like this, it's really important to have an error recovering parser so that you can provide information in those kinds of cases. And the Glimmer parser was written before Glint was a twinkle in Dan's eye, right? It was not not a thing that people were thinking about really at all in, I think the current version dates to 2015 or 2016. Uh, prior to that, we were using an earlier form of handlebars parsing, but like that's a long time ago. TS had not eaten the front end world. The expectations for what you might have in a project like Ember, nobody had that except nascently then React via TSX and its new integration, but very different world then than when Dan started building all of this in 2018 in his brain and then 2019, 2020 for reals. Uh, so it makes sense that it doesn't exist and it would be great if it did. Here we are. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> also, this is why, and if you look, uh, having it in the comment is good, but also if you look at the history of Glint, there are a lot of very detailed, very careful commit messages and our PRs tend to have been broken up into many atomic commits. Uh, Dan always does this. I try as well. I commend this to you, especially for open source projects like this, because it gives you some shot of remembering and it gives like it. You could just see it gave us some shot at remembering, but it also gives someone else coming along to work on this later some hope of understanding why this thing was done the way it's done and breaking that up from all the other things that might be going on in a big pull request to make some new capability possible or some large refactoring. Yeah. I can strongly, strongly recommend the GitLens extension for code that makes it really easy to say, ah, okay, this is from PR442 yep. where we were doing bad things and malformed templates. <laughs> really, really helps for figuring out context on this kind of thing. Particularly yes. if, like Chris says, you've done your best to leave a good set of breadcrumbs in your good history. Um, so anyway, after we've gone through all of this stuff to figure out if we don't have an answer, we can assume we do, this is where we go ask TypeScript and say, hey, here's a position, what are the completions? And again, we don't know anything about how that process is actually being performed. It's just a black box right. to us. And so we get these completions back out and we play the same game where it's like, okay, 
this was called name, now it's called label, we need to convert the kinds, we attach a bunch of arbitrary data that turns out not to be so arbitrary because we just need to pass it off to get completion entry details later. Um, and then sort text because otherwise code puts things in an order that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and we can scroll down, but at this point, I think you've seen both the simple and the complicated version of this, and it's always mm -hmm. basically the same thing. It's okay, let's look at, well, get completion details is, uh, contradicts what I was about to say, because this is a follow on <laughs> step to get completions. Right. And so it doesn't quite follow the same thing. We've already packaged up some data in a shape that's item. useful to us. And yeah. so we just immediately call get completion entry details. Um, we do still do the same part at the end where we have to convert parts to different formats. Um, in particular, this is a key piece that's very different is the language server protocol lets you tag text with the kind of text mm, it is. Yeah. So we say, hey, this is Markdown, and that gives you a certain amount of understanding of like, this is how it should be highlighted and formatted and so on. Um, but, okay, putting that aside, ooh, we're using something deprecated. Oh, no. Use the signature with user preferences instead. I bet all I have to do is like, or something. Oh, oh, oh. Wrong invocation, yeah. Yep, there. Ta-da! <laughs> Easy. Um, anyway, it's the same pattern that we've seen over and over. So we say, OK, mm -hmm. it's a URI. There's a position. Let's find out what that is in terms of what TypeScript can see. Let's check to make this is a, make sure this is a file we can actually answer questions about. We'll ask TypeScript about it. And in this case, TypeScript has this can rename flag. And if that's not there, then we have nothing to say. And then we map things back to their original location. Yep get the contents, do a little bit of slicing, and we're done. And this just happens over and over mm -hmm. and over. Get hover, get the offset, is it analyzable? Ask the service, return if there's nothing there, do a bunch of conversion, hand it off. Hand it back, yep. And yeah, I mean, like, all of this is basically variations on that same theme. Mm -hmm. um, some of this could probably be pulled out into a separate module, but as Chris said, this isn't nearly as big or terrible as some of the other stuff we looked at last time. So um, but some of this code action stuff is a little more text munchy than some of the other things we're doing in here. Anyway, we just um, rolled past a, a thing that caught my attention, which was insert glint ignore. So this is, well, you can see, I think Chad wrote this. Mm -hmm. um, there is a code action for, from TypeScript that's like, hey, you have a red squiggle. One of the things you can do when you click the little light bulb next to it is say, I don't care about this, make it go away. And what we do is when we see that code action coming through, if that red squiggle is actually in a template, then we have to convert it into a glint ignore yep. instead of a TS ignore instead. Is there a corresponding one for expect error, which TypeScript and we kind of recommend? Uh, but that may in fact be, because there is no code action for that. Uh, these are all lint issues. I don't know. I want the other one. X string. Or well, no, I see what you're doing. Yeah. Hmm. The problem is I'm getting ES lint stuff instead. I'm getting the yellow squiggle instead of the yeah, red squiggle. If you console.log X on the next line, then we should see the actual. Now. Because we were also getting the TypeScript lint of unused before. And now it doesn't have a suggestion for us. Why doesn't hmm. it? Have a I don't know. Huh. No quick fixes available. All right. No. Well, thanks, TypeScript. Yeah. You let us down. <laughs> Uh, well, regardless, there is some code action that'll do TS ignore there. And. Ignore, you, know, oh, you typed. <laughs> and now ESLint is And now ESLint's going to say, you can't use that. Please use expect error. And... Just mad that I didn't give an explanation for why I was doing it. Anyway, um, so under other circumstances, there would have been a code action to produce this. And I don't know why it doesn't doing that. Clearly, this is something that I don't use myself very often. I'm yeah. code actions are one of those things that like they're nice in principle. I don't actually use them a lot in practice. 
Hmm. Oh. Okay, cool. That doesn't seem like it worked the way they were expecting it to. <laughs> So anyway, that's why I don't use them very often, but yeah. Thankfully, that was TypeScript. That wasn't us. So I can feel confident in saying that we would have fallen over in exactly the same way, but it wouldn't have been Because <laughs> remember, everybody, we just do as little as possible, hand it to TypeScript, and let it be in trouble when things go wrong. Exactly. And that's really it for the language server. Um, are there things that I have forgotten to talk about, Chris? I don't. I don't think so, because I think really that gets at the the core thing, which we talked about last time, but now you've seen, which is they do the same things. It's just that one of them is sort of this one shot pass. Never mind the details about caching around dash dash build and dash dash build dash dash watch. But fundamentally, the language server has to do the same things, but in a stateful way and with a bunch of extra uh, mapping back and forth to handle the differences in the protocols. And that's what we just saw. And the only other thing I want to emphasize there, I think, is we do have that really clear distinction. We spent almost all of our time here looking at the language server implementation. There's that little thin bit at the front end, which is VS Code invoking it. But if you're building a NeoVim plugin that invokes it, you would do that little bit of wiring in the ways that are specific to a NeoVim extension talking to a language server protocol, and then the rest of it you don't have to do because the rest of it just is the language server protocol stuff that we've already built and wired up. So in general, the goal here is that mostly you shouldn't have to touch the VS Code or NeoVim or Emacs or Visual Studio or Nova or whatever your editor of choice is you should just to implement new capabilities, and I say mostly, but you should mostly just be able to implement the language server protocol capability in Glint. And then when we release a new version of the language server, everybody else just gets those capabilities basically for free that has an existing generic language server consumption tool. So Sublime Text has a language server client and you set up a little configuration for it. NeoVim, same thing. You go on down the line. If you're building a custom integration, you're going to have to do a little more than that. But if you have a generic language server client, you can get a very long way by just doing that and nothing else because that nice separation of concerns. And it's worth emphasizing again, as we said at the very start, that that's one of the key things that we and Dan specifically have worked really hard to do is have these clean lines where each of these things has a really discrete responsibility. They have a low degree of coupling. You can do a bunch of work in the transform manager layer without having to touch the language server. I had to do a boatload of stuff when I built the dash dash build integration. And I had to change like two lines for the language server. And that was great. All we had to do was say, ah, you talk in terms of transform manager pools now. The end. That was really all I had to do. Everything else, quote unquote, just worked at that point. So broad strokes, note that distinction. And then if you want to add some features to the language server, add them to the language server and VS Code and NeoVim and everybody else should get them, quote unquote, for free. Broad strokes. You might actually have to say, hey, VS Code, please this thing can ask for that if there's a VS Code extension hook that needs to do that. But that should be pretty minimal, and the majority of the work will be in the language server protocol implementation. And that's actually Anything one else? thing that's worth yep. calling out, just on that note, is when we do a release, the version in every package.json in this repository gets bumped regardless of whether it needs to or not, which means that the version in package.json for the code extension also gets bumped every time, even if the code extension itself hasn't changed. That's caused, I think, a little bit of anxiety in the community as they look at this repo and see, oh, we're on Glint yeah. 1.2, but the version in, that's published isn't nearly that big a number. Um, that's fine. We should probably include something in the readme that says that that's fine. We yeah. also, if we ever go down the path of bundling a copy of Glint core with it, then we would definitely want to start re-releasing the extension every time we right. did that. Probably we should automate that process because right now it involves me 
saying a lot of bad words at the like marketplace <laughs> UI as I try to find my key so that I can do the publish and it's never going to end well. So, but that's a problem for another day. And with that, I think we're actually at the end here in that I think we have covered the entire architecture diagram we showed all those weeks ago end to end. Uh, if folks ask questions, we'll put together a mailbag episode as we've promised, but so far people haven't, which I'm going to take to mean that we just answered things so conclusively and exhaustively, don't say exhaustingly, <laughs> that people don't have any questions because we've just covered it all. But hopefully this has been helpful. Dan, thank you so much for making the time and for building Glint because it has been a huge, huge win for the Ember community at large. So. Yeah, of Tis course. Thank you for uh, running these conversations. It's been a lot of fun talking through all yeah. of this and remembering the bits I've forgotten. <laughs> As one does when any building any large software project. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. I believe a few episodes I said to do it with your elbows. So this time figure out how to do it with your knee. <laughs>